Hame taki epi, chante washte and ape chills up here, anke makia pia, wana, dakota makoche, gaish minnesota makoche, de taha wo wadake. Hello, relative. I greet you with a happy heart. My name is Anka Elbaltaine. I'm greeting you in the Dakota language, which is the indigenous language of the land from which I am currently speaking. This is the northern area of the Great Plains region of the United States and Canada. You may have heard the Dakota language referred to as Lakota or Sioux. And my colleague, Shishokuduta Jobendixen, was not able to join me for this recording but I am deeply indebted to him for sharing his language, culture, and this collaboration with me. So we came to this project because we were trying to tackle the complexities of teaching an indigenous language, in this case, Dakota, inside various colonial systems, such as state universities and local public schools. These systems often prescribe how student progress is to be assessed and graded without regard to either the particular imperatives of language learning, nor the cultural wealth and wisdom of the individual language and culture that are being taught. This means that students take a course in an indigenous language, but then are assessed in a very non-indigenous way, which is also not very conducive to optimizing their emotional experience of the course, nor to maximizing their learning opportunities. So we began this study to find a better way one that would be as authentic to the culture involved as possible, but that could also be carried out within the rigid format mandated by these colonial institutions. We have two overall aims with our work and they nourish each other. One aim is to restore the Dakota language and we hope all indigenous languages to use and vibrance in its land, maintaining what has survived colonization and moving toward a future after colonization in which indigenous peoples are rightly respected as stewards of the land and experts in sustainable living and have sovereignty over their own ways of life. The Dakota scholar Wazia Tawin refers to this as taking down the fort and creating an, an oppression free society. We see language reclamation through language teaching and learning as an indispensable part of taking down the fort and of linguicide and linguistic marginalization and building an oppression-free multilingual society to live in in the future. On the other hand, we are also very concerned with the efficacy of our language programs because languages like Dakota are very endangered and do not have time to waste with ineffective classes as the first language speakers grow old and leave this world. While many of you are experienced in the literature and language testing, we aren't specialists in this area. So we take an interdisciplinary approach to the literature. The framework that we've developed takes as its starting point, the work of Alana Shohami. Shohami calls for language testing that better embodies democratic values by raising diverse voices, privileging interactive assessments, protecting the rights of those tested and assigning greater responsibility to those who design and administer the test to acknowledge and engage with the power dynamics that are at play, both within the design of the assessments and within the experiences of those being assessed. In this case, we're designing assessments to be administered within institutions that we hope challenge the power of those very institutions. We also draw on the work of Paris and Alam regarding culturally sustaining pedagogy, which of course is of the utmost importance when we're talking about the revitalization and maintenance of endangered languages. These scholars point to the central importance of student empowerment in steering the curriculum, speaking back to the teachers and the institutions and defining for themselves what communities they belong to and what those identities entail. These elements are only made more important when we situate the learning of uh, indigenous languages in their context of enormous historical and generational trauma, as well as high and complex language anxiety among heritage learners. To take a purely prescriptivist or teacher-driven approach is to allow the heritage language classroom to become a place of unspoken terror. 
where one is judged on the legitimacy of one's identity using proficiency as a metric. That is not only unproductive, it is counterproductive, in fact, because what emerges is a well-known phenomenon in which non-Indigenous students do better in the classes than Indigenous students for their lack of relationship to the language. We certainly do not want to create that imbalance. Moreover, Pennycook's critical applied linguistics is similarly premised on the observation that all language, all knowledge is political as is language. And that post-colonial, or here we are saying decolonial um, politics are tied to post-structuralism and primarily emancipatory increasing access both to the language itself and to understanding the mechanisms that have made the language inaccessible in the first place are the goal of this type of education. So we construct an assessment framework that be, brings variation, situatedness, cultural specificity, and relationship into the classroom, centers them, and in the process reveals how they were marginalized in the first place under the construct of so-called objectivity, which is so often the marketing slogan of colonial power structures. McCarty and Lee's critical culturally revitalizing pedagogy is a variation on these theories that was developed specifically within the indigenous North American context, focused on bringing community sovereignty into the classroom. This involves decolonizing by at once allowing indigenous cultures, languages, and histories to be prominent in the classroom, and also not allowing any indigenous person's lack of fluency in these to invalidate that person's claim to their indigeneity. This is a complicated and emotionally fraught endeavor. Communicative competence stretches back in language education to the 1970s, but still hasn't been fully prioritized in most classrooms. Its premise is that learners of a language need to master interactions with all the pragmatic, cultural, nonverbal, and sociolinguistic information they necessarily include, rather than just learning a number of words and a number of grammatical rules. Communicative language teaching is the school of thought that the best way to gain this kind of mastery in interaction is in fact by interacting. We employ a 90% plus immersion approach and communicative language teaching. And therefore our assessments are communicative tasks of various kinds since we practice direct assessment. Furthermore, CLT aligns with the Dakota worldview that everything occurs in relationship and therefore emphasizes clarity and intelligibility over phonetic or grammatical accuracy, essentially grading on the former and providing support and guidance on the latter. By intersecting these frameworks, students are engaged in learning, practicing, and creating cultural codes all the time that they are learning the language, and that includes the times that they are being assessed. I'll now walk through how we came up with the model that we're discussing and how it is constructed, and then we'll look at some concrete examples. So the design of this is a collaborative, iterative, and discursive process where we intend to adjust the design and application of the model um, based on the learning outcomes we see and student feedback on their experience. Now, something to note about the student feedback is that we've carefully avoided asking students about their preferences of this versus any other model and rather ask them about various impacts the model may have had on their learning and how that compared to the imposed colonial model of assessment, which is usually a multiple choice exam. We do this because our experience aligns with research that shows that many learners, although they may benefit more from communicative, interactive, and applied learning experiences, when asked about their preferences, will generally choose the more familiar modalities, regardless of any inferior outcomes. And so we essentially disregard preference and ask students to analyze their experiences more deeply. We'll discuss the results in a moment. How the model is constructed is important because it is explicitly and openly values-based. We contend that all assessment is values-based, but colonial models pretend not to be. Instead, we carefully considered the values we wanted to emphasize and made values-driven choices of modalities. Those are, one, proficiency is expressed through the ability to complete communicative tasks, so tasks are the mode of assessment. 
Two, cultural norms are inextricable from language, and so they are embedded in assessment and assessed explicitly. Three, relating is primary among communication goals, so clarity is focused on over specific corrections. Four, the student always has some room for choice and self-expression, even if the task uh, may be dictated by the context or by the teacher. And five, there are always opportunities for varied feedback, self, peer, teacher conversational response and teacher corrections. So the model is based on this nonlinear construct you see with the blue background here. Across the top, you see what teachers consider in designing the task and its rubric. How is this culturally relevant? How is Dakota epistemology centered? What language is situationally appropriate? Which of the actful modes are in use in this task? Dakota Wichoha refers to the values and dispositions that are expected to be demonstrated when students do that task. We have chosen a single source document, a list of Dakota values by an organization of the same name, Dakota Wichoha, because like any other culture, every Dakota person will define their culture a little differently. And of course, these concepts will be translated and defined by each person a little differently. So on the one hand, it's a little disingenuous to try to boil them down to single definitions. But on the other hand, we're trying to move away from implicit expectations that keep students in the dark and toward explicitness, which at least allows the stance that we've taken to be seen, discussed, negotiated, and reconsidered as students respond to it. The cultural values or norms relevant uh, to these tasks are laid out in green but each task will draw on them differently. Below, we have clarity at the center and that feedback is weighted most heavily for the reasons that we've discussed. There's also space for the student's drive or choice in the task for self, peer, and teacher feedback and for the teacher's both relational response and corrections, preventing both the focus on clarity from obscuring error identification and the task performance from becoming too non-relational, which colonial models would often have it be. You see that these have been given weighted points over here, um, depending on the assessment. They are weighted to create a numeric uh, grade, which is required by the institution, but in a way where the student is not left to interpret the number but rather the number interprets a rich experience of reciprocal interaction and feedback that the student has already had. Situated learning theory from Love and Wagner enriches critical and culturally sustaining pedagogies by framing learning itself as a social activity, wherein the identity of the learner, the world of the learner, and the relationship between the two are constantly being negotiated. Essentially, to learn is to participate in a given community or perhaps in a series of concentric circles of communities and to change and be changed by those communities in the process. Learning as absorption of objects transmitted then is not an accurate picture of what our language learners are really doing. And so what is learned and what would be correct to learn are not objective or static facts. This again makes prescriptive testing inappropriate for our work. Here we see a way in which we have done what Shohami named, used assessment to drive an educational agenda. That agenda, in addition to everything we've already said, is one that leads away from depersonalized, falsely objective paradigms of language as object and towards situated work with language as personalized tool. The truth is the correct way of speaking Dakota on, depends on all the factors that you see here. It depends on what activity you're doing, um, who you're engaging with, what paralinguistic communication is happening, what cultural expectations are in play. It depends on what nation you belong to. Are you Dakota, not Dakota, but also indigenous or a settler like myself? Are you an elder, young person? Do you have a certain role in the community such as a grandmother or a pipe keeper? And in which gender do you speak? 
the coda is spoken and written differently based on all these factors. Furthermore, the correct way of expressing something often depends on where you are standing when you express it. And the Dakota view of place often doesn't translate to settler paradigm. So translation isn't meaningful. Furthermore, we can talk about Twitter and Facebook and iPhone batteries in Dakota, but these are new and evolving language forms that have to be treated as such. Time is also relevant in the sense that the teacher's expectations of learners on a given task may differ each time the task is used as an assessment, depending on how the class has been progressing. Since many tasks involve live interactions, surprises and new variables can emerge that change what correct is. Finally, each individual should be languaging to the best of their ability at that moment, but this is different among all learners and ever more so in heritage language classes where the measuring of proficiency levels borders on impossible given learners highly diverse backgrounds and linguistic experiences. Our courses must accommodate that. And this framework makes that not only possible, but very natural and non-disruptive. Again, we need to be mindful of the high levels of anxiety and identity threat that come into play with colonized languages. So assessment tools that allow us to work with speakers at any level, but always recognize, encourage, and measure their progress without stigma are vital to this work. We've been employing this framework in several contexts in 2021. We have both beginning and intermediate learners engaging in these assessment tasks in both formal university classes and less formal community-based classes. We continue gathering data on the outcomes we see in the students' evaluations of their experiences of these tools, but here are some early outcomes. We see students stringing together longer and richer verbal texts and written texts because of their engagement with the task rising to more occasions of unexpected interactions, such as misunderstandings, unfamiliar terms, or unanticipated responses, and demonstrating their ability to hurdle those obstacles. We also see that unlike with prescriptive level-based tests, learners at all proficiency levels are willing to engage to the best of their ability. And when they are able to communicate more complicated messages, they push themselves to do so meaning they use the assessment as a chance to take a risk and validate their strength rather than it being a time to hold a microscope over their weaknesses. We also don't see as much use of awkward or nonsensical direct translation as may come out on exams because students tend to more often draw on their Dakota repertoire and use circumlocution rather than translating from their English repertoire. Finally, we see more progress toward culturally acceptable and comfortable ways of communicating because those expectations are being made explicit. For example, we see more use of averted gaze, non-interruption, and idiomatic responses like we might see from first language speakers because students are trying consciously to communicate both linguistically and paralinguistically. We have student reports. Down here, you see some outcomes. We've asked them to compare their experiences with multiple choice exams and rather um, than seeing a, a, a big split in the outcome, we actually see very strong outcomes with regard to how interesting, challenging, relationship building and confidence building and culturally informative these assessments are. Because we had to record this presentation earlier than we anticipated, my colleague wasn't able to join me and we also don't have the full data from the first year gathered yet, but we have created a website where you can check in on the progress of this study. By the time you watch this recording in June, we will have additional data and we will continue updating the site in July and throughout the next school year. So we think of this as an ongoing discursive project and we welcome you to interact with us there on the site share your feedback and questions and share the models of assessment that you may be working with along similar lines. We'd really like to be in community with other practitioners around culturally sustaining and decolonial pedagogies um, regarding indigenous languages, but also any other language. You'll also find our bibliography there. So please visit this website to share your work with us and keep in contact. 
thank you for your time and attention today. It's been an honor to be able to participate in this conference and we look forward to meeting more of you and collaborating with our global colleagues in the future. Thank you, we will see you again.